In this lecture, you'll learn about logical interfaces, which is where our IP addresses are configured in ONTAP. An IP address or worldwide port name, WWPN, is associated with a logical interface. So if you're using the LIF for SIFS or NFS or iSCSI, it's going to be an IP address. If you're using the LIF for Fiber Channel, it's going to be a WWPN. Your LIFs are owned by SVMs, the storage virtual machines. The SVM is the unit of secure multi-tenancy in ONTAP. So let's say we've got an SVM for department A and an SVM for department B, and we want to keep them separate and secure from each other. Well, the two main things associated with an SVM are the volumes and the lifts. The volumes are where the data is, so we want to keep the data separate and secure from each other, and the lifts are where the IP addresses are. We want to keep the connectivity secure and separate between the SVMs, so our lifts are also associated with an SVM. Assigning an IP address to a LIF rather than assigning it directly to a physical port allows mobility of the IP address. The LIF can move between different physical ports. So if the physical port goes down, for example, we can still keep the IP address up by moving it to a different physical port. Multiple LIFs can be placed on the same port and lifts can move to other ports on the same or another node. So for example, if a node fails or if a link fails, or if we wanna take a node down for maintenance, then we can keep that IP address available by moving the lift. And a lift keeps its IP address whenever it does move location. Our lift types. As soon as we have finished setting up the cluster, we've got one node management lift per node, and we've got one cluster management lift for the entire cluster, and we've got two or more cluster lifts for the cluster network per node. So you've seen that already, and we're going to need to create additional data lifts to serve the client data access over NFS, SIFS, iSCSI, or Fiber Channel. So the node and the cluster management lifts are obviously for management. The cluster lifts are for the cluster network, for our traffic that's going internally between nodes, and we're going to create the data lifts for our client data access. There are both NAS and SAN type data lifts. NAS and SAN protocols cannot share the same lift, but the same lift can serve both NFS and SIFS. It's not recommended to do that though. If you are supporting both SIFS and NFS, it's recommended to create separate lifts for each. That provides more flexible fault tolerance and loads management that we'll talk about a little bit later in this lecture. A lift can be placed on a physical port, on an interface group, or on a VLAN interface. A lift cannot go on a physical port, which is a member of an interface group, and if a VLAN is created on a physical port, then lifts can be added to the VLAN or the underlying physical port. It's going to be untagged traffic that goes to the physical port. I'll explain that coming up in the next few slides. And if a VLAN is created on an interface group, lifts can be added to the VLAN or interface group. Untagged traffic will go to the interface group. Okay, so let's have a look and see what all of these different rules mean. First example, we've got a physical port. Our physical port here in this example is E0A. We could put lift one, for example, directly on that physical port. In our example, the lift has got IP address 10.10.10.10. Next example, an interface group. Here, we have bundled our physical ports of E0A and E0B into the interface group A0A. In that case, the lift can go onto the interface group, but it can't go onto an underlying physical port once that port is a member of an interface group. Next example, VLAN interfaces. Here we've got physical port E0A, and on top of there, we've created a VLAN interface of E0A.10 for VLAN 10, and another one of E0A.20 for VLAN 20. In this case, a lift 
can go on to the VLAN 10 interface. We could also have a lift go on to the VLAN 20 interface. And we can also have a lift applied directly to the underlying physical port. In this example, any traffic that comes into that physical port, which is tagged with VLAN 10, will hit the VLAN 10 interface. Any traffic that is tagged with VLAN 20 will hit the VLAN 20 interface, and any traffic which is untagged will hit the underlying physical port. Personally, I would not recommend doing this. I think it would get really confusing. If you are going to be using VLAN interfaces on top of a physical port, I would make sure that all traffic hitting that port is assigned to a particular VLAN. Next example is VLAN on top of an interface group. So yes, we can do this. Here we have got ports E0A and E0B RV physical ports. We have bundled them into the logical interface group of A0A. And on top of the interface group of A0A, we've created VLAN interfaces. We've got VLAN interface A0A.10 for VLAN 10 and VLAN interface A0A.20 for VLAN 20. In this situation, we can put a lift onto the VLAN interface. So we could have a lift on VLAN 10. We can also put a lift on VLAN 20 interface. We can also assign a lift to the underlying interface group. And again, here it's similar to the last example. So here, if any traffic hits physical port E0A or E0B, which have been bundled into the interface group. If that traffic is tagged with VLAN 10, it will hit the VLAN A0A.10 interface. Any traffic tagged with VLAN 20 will hit the A0A.20 interface. And any traffic which is not tagged will hit the interface group interface of A0A. In this situation, again, we cannot assign a lift directly to an underlying physical port when that physical port is a member of an interface group. Okay, next thing to talk about is the recommendation is to have one data lift per node, per network, per protocol, per SVM. So, okay, what does that mean? Well, looking at an example here, we've got a couple of controllers in our cluster. And let's say that we are running SIFS, NFS, and iSCSI for a particular SVM. Let's say it's our department A SVM. Well, we should create separate lifts for SIFS, NFS, and iSCSI. That is the per protocol part. So we're going to have a SIFS lift one, an NFS lift one, and an iSCSI lift one on our first physical port on the controller. For this example, we do the same for the second port as well. This is actually not at the port level, this is at the network level. So when we say per network, what we mean is if the, we're connected to redundant switches, that would be two separate networks. So we have got iSCSI Lift 1, iSCSI Lift 2. We're also going to have iSCSI Lift 3 and iSCSI Lift 4. We do that for SIFs and NFS as well. Okay, so let's break this down. So one data lift per node, per network, per protocol, per SVM. Well, per node, we have got the two different nodes. Per network, we have got redundant switches. Per protocol, we've got SIFs, NFS, and iSCSI. And in this example, per SVM, we were just doing it for the Department A SVM. So for the Department A SVM, we'll have a different lift for every protocol, but with SIFs, NFS, and iSCSI. We've got different lifts per network. We've got redundant switches here, so we've got different lifts for both, and also per node as well. So we end up with all of those different lifts. If we also had a Department B SVM, and let's say that the Department B SVM is running NFS only, it's not running SIFS or iSCSI, well, in that case, we would have NFS Lift 1, NFS Lift 2, NFS Lift 3, and NFS Lift 4 for SVM Department B. Okay, so hopefully that was pretty clear there. Let's work through another example using interface groups this time. So here I've configured interface groups on my controllers. Let's say this is port E0C and E0D, the physical ports in controller one, and I've bundled those into a logical interface group of A0A. 
and on controller 2 the same thing i've got physical ports e0c and e0d on controller 2 and i've bundled those into the interface group of a0a on controller 2. well what has changed now is before we had the interface group we had two separate uplinks from both controllers going to the switches but now that we have bundled those into an interface group from the controller's point of view it looks like a single uplink so on the network part, we're now using one network rather than two separate networks. So we're going to require half the amount of lifts. So looking at the lifts that we would create here, we would have SIFS lift one, NFS lift one, and iSCSI lift one on controller one on its A0A interface group, and SIFS lift two, NFS lift two, and iSCSI lift two on controller two's A0A interface group some notes on our lifts so as i said one data lift per node per network per protocol per svm is recommended and that is a pretty hard rule the different lifts can share underlying physical ports or have their own dedicated ports consider the workload requirements when designing the layout of lifts to physical ports and interface groups okay so let's go back a slide and consider that let's say for this example here that iSCSI required more bandwidth than SIFS and NFS does. What I've done in the slide here is I've just done a really simple layout of I've created my recommended lifts. That is the part that is a pretty hard rule. So if we are running SIFS, NFS and iSCSI and we have got two nodes and we have got the two networks, the two redundant switches, we are going to have this amount of lifts. We would have iSCSI lift one, lift two, lift three, and lift four. We'd also have lift one, two, three, and four for NFS and for SIFS as well. In this example, you can see that the lifts can share the underlying physical ports or the underlying interface groups or the underlying VLAN interfaces. Here, I've put iSCSI lift one, NFS lift one, and SIFS lift one on the same physical port. I've done the same with lift two, lift three, and lift four for each protocol. So you can see that the lifts can share underlying ports. But what if iSCSI did require better performance than SIFS and NFS? Well, in that case, I would probably use different underlying ports for iSCSI. So I would have separate physical ports or interface groups for iSCSI and I would have SIFs and NFS on separate underlying physical ports or interface groups. I would still have this amount of lifts though. Okay, the last thing to tell you is to prioritize load balancing traffic across nodes rather than shooting direct data access. This prevents a single port or node from becoming saturated and the cluster network adds minimum latency. Let's go back to the diagram again to explain this so in this example let's say that i had got volume one which was owned by controller one and it's being used by our nfs clients so in that situation you can see that nfs lift one and nfs lift two with the layout that we've used here are terminating on controller one so whenever a client comes in and hits the IP address on NFS lift one or the IP address on NFS lift two, they're going to hit controller one, which is where the volume is located, and they're going to get direct data access. We've also got NFS lift three and NFS lift four, which are homed on controller two. Again, they're going to have different IP addresses. So let's say the NFS lift one is 10.10.10.10, lift two is 10.10.10.11, 3 is 10.10.10.12 and 4 is dot 13. Well, if a client hits either of those last two IP addresses, their incoming connection is going to terminate on controller 2 and then to access the data for reads or writes, that traffic is going to go over the cluster network. So you might be thinking, oh, well, I don't want that to happen. I want all of my incoming client connections to be hitting controller 1, but no, you would be wrong. The the amount of latency that is added when traffic goes over the cluster interconnect because it hasn't hit the same controller but the volume is located on is actually minimal. It's a very small amount of latency that is added. So the performance gains that you get from spreading the load across all your different controllers are greater than the bad part of the slight amount of extra latency being added for the cluster network. 
So that's why it's best practice. You want to have lifts spread across all the different nodes in your cluster. You want those client connections to be spread across everywhere. That's going to give you the power of all your different nodes. You're now using all those different network connections, also all the CPU and RAM and all your different nodes. So you're load balancing there, and that's going to give you the best possible performance. Thanks for watching. If you want to get hands-on practice with NetApp Storage for free on your laptop, then you can download my free ebook, which you can see above my head right now. Also, check out my NetApp Storage Complete course, which will teach you everything you could possibly want to know about ONTAP. Thanks.